Okay, hello everybody. Um, welcome to this talk about Flow3 and the semantic web. Um, I'm Sebastian Kurfürst, uh, just something quick about me. Um, I'm a student at the Technical University of Dresden, but I'm almost finishing my studies. I'm currently writing my diploma thesis. And actually what you see here is all being part of my diploma thesis is actually quite a big part of it. Um, I started in Type, type of 3 with about 2002 and uh, in the beginning of 2005 I became one of the version 4 core developers and um, since then I'm mostly known for, um, for XSpace and Fluid, I guess, and I'm more moving into the version 5 and Flow 3 and Phoenix direction. Um, in my spare time I have two hobbies. One is um, I go climbing very intensely sometimes. and I also have um, a company called Sandstorm Media, um, which I plan to start full time in the beginning, in the middle of November when I'm finished my studies. So I have time back since then, um, starting in mid of November. So that's it about me. Um, as said, um, what has what's what I present is basically part of my diploma thesis. And it's actually what follows now is a short introduction to the semantic web because it's essential to get a core idea of what the whole topic is about. Um, so I'm talking now about linked data. I hope so. And actually, uh, linked data and the semantic web, I'll take this as synonyms. So sometimes I say linked data, sometimes I'll say semantic web. But that's all the same thing for me now. So let's start with a simple question. Let's say um, you want to go partying um, and you have a question like, okay, I want to find all parties in my hometown which happened today and which cost less than five euros of entrance fee. Um, today what you would like to do is uh, you have to go to Google, you do manual crawling, you, have, you get all kinds of uh, results from different event sites, you have to compile a list manually on a sheet of paper. So that's okay if you do that one time, but if you have to do that every day for some reason, that gets really boring. And um, yeah, you know, I, yeah, I do party often, so I have, <laughs> I need that. <laughs> no, um, and the idea is that tomorrow this should be done by linked data, um, and I'll show you in a bit how this should work. Um, so what actually is this magic thing called linked data? Um, Essentially, it's just a simple graph. Um, that's a pretty nice, simple concept. Um, so you have nodes in this graph, and you have edges between the nodes, um, and you can use a graph to represent any kind of information. So that's just a small example, saying I am a student at the Technical University of Dresden. I'm a Type 3 project developer. I have Jochen as a friend, and by the way, the Technical University of Dresden is located in Saxony. So that's just to get an idea that you can model the real world inside such a graph really easily. And you can also, you can put any kind of data actually into such a graph. Um, okay, that's pretty boring you might see, think. That's also quite old. So what's so cool about it? Actually, there's one missing bit which I forgot to say about um, the graph. It, it doesn't look like this in, in, in reality, but there's one simple trick which enables all the cool uses of linked data, which is that instead of the node for Sebastian Kofus, we don't use a string, but we use an URL for that, which is a unique identifier. Um, so for example, my personal URL is sebastian.kofus.eu. Um, so actually the real graph looks like this. So it's a little small, but it says, okay, Sebastian Kurfürst EU is member of the Technical University of Dresden URL. And you see, um, we have one more node on the left side, which says, okay, Sebastian Kurfürst EU um, has the name Sebastian. So that's actually how we Im avoid ambiguity in the semantic web, is by using um, URLs as identifiers. Um, so that's just the basic idea how you can model information. Um, there's one, one little catch to that. Um, so the idea is that this graph is, um, uh, that you can split this graph into certain parts. So because that's really abstract so far, you might think, okay, where is the data actually published? Well, in fact, it can, can be published anywhere. So actually, in reality, it looks more like this. So each color now represents one URL or one, one website, for example. So I, the green one could be my personal website, where I say, okay, Sebastian Kurfürst.eu is a person, and he's called Sebastian. And um, I have a friend called Jochen, 
And that's all the information I publish on my personal website. And then the Technical University of Dresden, which is orange here, could say that I'm a member of the Technical University, and she could also say that the Technical University is located in Saxony, for example. So you see that um, this graph doesn't exist in reality on a single computer, but it just exists by collecting all the information in the, in the uh, linked data web. So um, that's just the basic concept, that you can store this graph in a distributed fashion. Um, there is one technical detail to that, um, which is essentially, if, you if we take one edge, for example, um, Sebastian is a member of the TU Dresden. Um, because the graph is really hard to work with, I mean, it's a nice way to visualize it, but it's really hard to work with, there is a format called RDF for that. And, um, so, and this has a syntax which is called a triple. So actually, um, the first part of the triple is called the subject, the predicate, and the object. So that's just the normal sentence structure you, you have in normal English, for example. So actually, how it is stored in a computer is, is a list of such triples. So for example, Sebastian Kurfürst to you is the member of the TU Dresden, or Sebastian Kurfürst to you has the name Sebastian. That's just how you see it. So. You might think, okay, that's a, bit, a little bit boring now, and I agree, I mean, we have a really small graph of information. In reality, the linked data web is a little bit bigger. In fact, it looks like this. Um, so you see in the middle, that's, maybe you don't see it, but the middle circle where everything points, so that's the DBpedia. This is a, a linked data version of the, of the Wikipedia where they exp extracted the little information you have on the side of many articles, like uh, how big a country is, how many people it has. And they use this information and export it into the semantic web. And this is now a, a big information hub which links many different data sources together. So, um, the semantic web is essentially a distributed giant information graph. Um, that's the whole thing. <laughs> Pretty easy, actually. Um, hope you, hope I, I didn't lose anybody, because it's really vital that, you, that this is understood, um, because I am now building on top of that. Mm. So, Let's say you want, as a developer, you want to participate in this data cloud. Um, what do you need to do if you are a Flow 3 developer, for example? The current state is really bad, I have to say. It has a high learning curve. There are many, many standards you have to follow and many best practices. And there is virtually no framework support which gives you this end-to-end -end support for using this linked data. So. Um, for you as a normal PHP developer, or I mean as a, as a web developer, it is quite hard to, to um, um, participate in this linked data cloud. And that's also a problem that it's still pretty small. So although you saw the graph in the beginning, this graph has around uh, 200 different big websites which participate. And actually, that's not really much. I mean, if you imagine we have tens of millions of websites in the internet in total, and only 200 of them participate in linked data. So that's actually a really small part of the, of the web. So the question is, how can we grow that? As, and I have chosen the route that we can grow it by enabling developers to participate more easily. So what, what my goal was, and my goal still is, is to deeply integrate a, a linked data framework into Flow 3 which is pragmatic and production ready and also has a small learning curve. So it's pretty similar to Fluid in some ways, at least in terms of the goals. And the ultimate goal is actually developer happiness um, for the developers participating and using this framework. So, Flow 3 goes semantic. What does it mean in, in um, definite terms now? It actually consists of three layers. The first layer, you know, in, in Flow 3 we have this domain model. So we use domain-driven design and we have objects which represent our data. And so the first step, what we need to do is we need to take this data which we have stored in a database and we have objects for that and we have to transfer this to the semantic web, so as RDF. That's essentially the first step. Um, then we have um, RDFA generation and fluid templates. I'll quickly go to, I'll go to that later. And the third part, which is the most advanced part, is the cross-linking and enrichment of long texts and also learning. Um, actually, the first two parts are quite production-ready, I would say. The third part is a little more experimental. Um, 
But, you know, I mean, a diplomacy is also always has to have both parts in a way, and I think it's a really nice match. So we'll go to, through these three steps one by one, first starting with the export um, of domain models to RDF. So um, we have our domain model. This is a class in PHP. And um, actually, the only thing which you need to do to export this class to RDF is you have to define some mapping. Um, I don't want to go into the details now, but just I want to give you a feeling how easy it is. Um, the, for example, here we say, okay, the post is of the type Sioc types blog post. And um, the title of the blog post is a title in, uh, of the Dublin Core Schema. So that's one important concept I didn't introduce yet. Um, in RDF, um, for example, if I have the sentence like, I know Jochen, or I am friend of Jochen, then the question is, okay, I, we, I now said that I'm a URL, Jochen is a URL, and what about this I know him in a way? Um, if we would have just a string for that, there's the big question, what does it mean, actually? So what does it mean to know somebody or to be friend with somebody? And there are a lot of different definitions for that. And that's why um, people in the semantic web also use URLs for um, these kinds of, um, for these kinds of information, essentially. Um, so that's essentially like a domain model of, the um, of linked data, is, if you want to say it like that. Um, it's just, um, if you don't understand that fully, that's not a big problem. Um, it's, it's pretty easy to come up with these um, types, um, and you can just, there's a search engine where you can just put in something like title, and then it will tell you, oh, well, DC terms title seems like a good fit. Um, by the way, you don't only you are not only able to do this directly inside the class, but you are also able to do this in a configuration. So in this type, is, it's for example YAML, um, and that's a general concept we also want to employ in Flow 3, which is not implemented yet, but which we want to implement. That um, everything you can specify as an annotation in a model, you can also um, later on override via configuration uh, in a, some settings file. So that's a general principle which I just tried out in my diploma thesis and which worked really well for this use case. And I think it also scales well to lots of other use cases where you use annotations in Flow 3. Okay, so I just added these two lines um, in my model, and what do I get from that? Actually, you get quite a lot. You, it is a little unreadable now, <laughs> because that's the real data now. Um, so actually, this is two triples. The first one says block local blah 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 blah, um, has the title and then this dummy text. And the second one says this blog post blah 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 ha is created on, uh, I don't know, like 25th of July this year. Um, so this is actually a triple. This is this subject predicate object sentence. Um, and we do lots of other things around this triple to make sure we follow all the best practices for linked data, but you don't have to care about that. So you can actually you can open this, this URL in your browser and you will get some more information about the stuff and something like that. And then there's one more cool thing about it. So you might now ask, well, what's so cool about that? I mean, we just created some export to some format. That's pretty simple. Um, you're right. Actually, the semantic web is pretty simple. It's just that it's a, it has quite simple concepts, but it's a really powerful when you put it all together. So what we do from this data, we put it in a so-called triple store. A triple store is like a database, but it doesn't, it's not like a relational database, which has columns and rows and so on, and tables. Um, but it is um, a database for RDF triples. So for this graph, which you saw in the beginning, you can all throw this into a triple store, and then you can uh, do some queries on top of that. So just think of a triple store like a database, which has some language like SQL. It looks a little different, but still it's the same thing. It's a way to query information in this database. And by that, we actually Oh, sorry. By that, we actually gain quite a lot because imagine you have multiple Flow 3 applications. They can all add their data to the same triple store. And that's actually a, a quite a powerful concept that we ha can have data from many, many different sources, put them all into one triple store, and 
suddenly we can ask or we can uh, ask questions um, uh, which connect two different data sources together because they are all in one database in some way. And by using the URLs, they are uniquely identified. Um, so essentially, there's a language called SparkQL for querying that. And um, that's what I want to show now how this works. So it's also pretty easy. So if we take the example from the beginning, I could formulate a query like this. So a query is actually some graph fragment um, which has some placeholders in there. So in this case, the placeholder is the X and the Y. So it's the orange, um, the orange nodes. So I just say, I want to uh, uh, get every node um, which is a student at TU Dresden and which has some age, for example, um, and which works for the Type 3 project. And what you, could get, what you would get back is a table with where you get, okay, X is Sebastian and you get my age back. And if there is somebody else working on the Technical University of Dresden also working for Type 3, then I would get another, um, sadly there isn't, but it would be quite cool to have somebody. Um, but yeah, that would be the case that we get this different. Um, so that's actually what, if you, if you followed the, the, um, this or the, the talk of, um, um, about the code metrics, that's also something which I can really nicely imagine for um, a future version of the extension repository because um, we have lots of different sources. We have extensions, we have the extension metadata, we have um, comments to these extensions, um, we have author information, so who did it, um, all, all like that. We have metrics and we could all put this into one big data store called the triple store, and then we could ask questions like the ones which uh, um, Christian explained um, in the last talk, oh, the ta talk from, I think two hours ago. Um, okay, so that the, was the first point. It was exporting every data to the semantic web. Um, you might think you might have some problem now. Actually, what I talked about now was the semantic web and that's pretty nice and that has some cool ideas um, but it is a completely different story um, in terms of the document-based classical web so they both use HTTP and all that so the foundations are the same but um, it's like a completely different world and that's actually a big problem so if you browse the document-based classical web um, how, do, um, how do you get to the semantic web from there so actually how do you get from the document base to the semantic web when you use a nice browser, for example? Um, and for that, there is a other standard which is called RDF annotations or RDFA for short. And by that, um, you can add these annotations to your documents in the document-based classical web, and they con contain information about the semantic web. So you could imagine a browser of the future, so maybe Firefox, maybe. 18.0, I don't know how fast they change their version numbers now, but, um, well, maybe it is version 10, I don't know. So they could tell you, oh, well, I found some RDF annotation, I found that this is an address. Do you want to see that on Google Maps, for example? Or Firefox could ask you, oh, um, this is a city, should I fetch more information from Wikipedia, for example? So this is, um, it is still an open question how this could work in detail, but that's just the foundational standard which will enable these kinds of things so that your browser can help you discovering new information about it. And for that, you need exactly this. So that's actually quite fluid related. So we need to touch fluid for that because we want to help you generating these RDFA annotations. Um, there is again some configuration which needs to be done. It's a really long one. Actually, it's just again in the YAML file. You just have to say, OK, I want RDFA. And then magically something happens because this on top is my fluid template which just outputs my title of the block. And when you look in the source and say view source, then automatically some span tag around your content is wrapped. So, um, and this is actually RDFA. I don't want to go into the details again, so you see it's again the URL, it says um, the property is DC terms title, but it doesn't really matter to fully understand that because that's what the framework does for you. But if you now have a browser which, um, which reads this information, it's suddenly machine readable and the browser is able to fetch additional information about the block um, from the semantic web. So 
Again, you don't have to care about the details. Um, you just have to enable it, and then you magically the framework does the right thing and um, generates this RDF information. OK, actually, that was already my, my second part. So I have to talk a little slower. So. <laughs> I already talk a lot, I think. OK, so all you've seen so far is quite stable, I would say. So it has undergone quite some refactorings. Um, it's also something I want to use in my own company for quite some ways. Um, and it's also open source, by the way. The, all, everything you see here is open source on GitHub. Um, and what we enter now is a more unstable version of my work. So it's a little more experimental, which follows now. And um, it's meant as some kind of discussion base of trying out some new ideas. So if we visualize what we have so far, um, we have our system, or, or our Flow 3 instance, and it has some semantical data, and they have links between these nodes. So for example, our blog post has some, po or our blog post has some related posts, has an author, all that. So you could visualize that as some kind of graph again. So this is the RDF graph we have so far. Um, on the other hand, there are different other data sources on the, on the web, on the semantic web. And because everything inside, um, everything in the semantic web, every node has a URL, a unique URL, um, other data sources can link to your data. And that's actually the real power of the semantic web, that you have these cross-linking abilities. Um, so that's what you saw in the beginning, for example. You saw that the DBpedia linked, linked to lots of other data sources, and that lots of data sources linked to the DBpedia again. Um, so that's actually powered by exactly this phenomenon. However, there's one problem. Um, we are not able to do a link between, um, or it would be nice if we could do a link from our data to, for example, the DBpedia data, because then um, a lot of other people could discover our information, because um, for example, DBpedia is like the central hub of our system. So if we have a travel site, for example, a travel website, and we post some information about Berlin, um, it would be really nice if, um, if we could tell, oh, that's the same Berlin as the Berlin of DBpedia, for example. Um, and by that, um, a semantic web search engine, which exists by, by now and can be used, would also detect that our information is the same as, or it would give back our information site, for example, if you ask it for Berlin. So that would actually be a really nice feature. But so far, it's not possible, because there's no way to, to, um, to insert this URL somewhere. Because actually, it requires some user interaction. Um, I mean, you have your, imagine you have your Flow 3 application. You, you have some forms there, and some, you add some data there. You modify some data. That's all nice. But actually, we when you add some data to an external data source, um, we, we enrich our data. Because in the beginning, it was just a string Berlin inside the text field. But what we actually want is we want to tell, well, it's the Berlin in Germany, which is the, well, the capital of Germany, and not the Berlin in New Hampshire in the USA, or I don't know how many other Berlins we have in, in the world. So actually, we want to enrich information. Um, and that's why. Um, the user needs to need some interface, some user interface to check um, these backlinks, so to um, to insert these links and to check them also. So it's not possible, as it's logically not possible as a framework to automatically generate these links and not ask and then just use it because you never know if the framework is right or wrong. So actually, so far that's not possible and that's actually quite sad because, as said. Um, the, the semantic web consists of this. And it's actually the essence of the semantic web. It's this distributed nature of the graph. So the third component is called linkification. And this enables links to other participants of the semantic web. Um, I'll again show you what you need to configure, and then we'll show the result. So we have our domain model again. And you have to add two things. So for example, here I have a location property, which is of type string, uh, where you can insert, for example, this blog post is about Berlin, or this blog post is written in Berlin, or I don't know. I mean, you can imagine something. And what you have to specify is that it, can be it should be linkified. 
and that you actually expect a city to be inside there. So there's, you have to tell the system, okay, this is what I want in this text field. And what you get from that is pretty much. So imagine you have a fluid form you just built using your standard techniques you all know from XBase or Flow 3. And magically, this fluid form gets some new functionality because it now looks like this as soon as you enter some characters inside the location field. So you get some pop-up, pop some fly-out, which uh, automatically searches in the semantic web for Berlin. And now it tells us, well, there is Berlin in the capital of Germany. There is New Hampshire. There is Wisconsin and all the others we don't care about. And then um, you can, as a user, can make a decision, well, what is the Berlin I actually meant? So you click, just click the item you want to have. Um, and actually, I think that's really cool. So I have, I have just shown you in a video how this looks like. So you see, I, I add a blog post now. Um, and I type Berlin, and then we automatically get this information. So it, the system goes out to the semantic web and fetches all the information, um, and I can just simply select what I want there. Um, when I save the element, you'll see. Yeah, come on. <laughs> um, and the system really stores this information. That's what I show now. I open it again, and if I click it, then the Berlin I chose is still selected. So if I say, say oh, well, actually, I did the wrong choice here, I can just uh, select, I meant Berlin, New Hampshire, save again. And when I again edit, you see it's again New Hampshire, which is selected. So that's actually what you see from the user's perspective. Um, Actually, we use this in a lot of places. So actually, this is exported to the triple store, for example. So it's not anymore the string Berlin, which is exported to the triple store, but it's really the URL you choose by this, um, so the linked data URL you choose in this list. And the nice thing, again, is that you don't see the linked data URL as the end user. You can just see it if you, if you click the more information, then you actually get to this linked data URL. But that's something I, we really want to hide in front of our users, because if we tell them something about linked data and the semantic web and nodes and edges and ontologies, they are like, whoa, I don't want to have that. So we have to keep it really simple um, for them to use it. Um, so now what we talked about is linkification of single types. So a single text field like, um, for example, a location or a, or a company or a country or something like that, or a person name. Um, but there's also some other kind of information. So if you imagine um, you write a blog post or a news article or a product review, then you have in one single field, you have lots of information stored as a plain text. And it would be nice if we could be able to extract information from this text as well, because it contains lots of implicit information. So, for example, um, you you have a text where where you state something like, um, where it's yeah, it's a news article which says, oh, Barack Obama was in Paris, for example, and then some more text about this visit. Then it would be actually really nice if we could somehow detect that Barack Obama is the president of the United States and Paris is the city in France, so, um, and can also have this information in a machine-readable way. And that's now quite experimental, as I already said, but it's also quite easy for the user. Um, so that's a prototype you see now. So the same thing what you need is just one single annotation, just said RDF and rich text, true. And then you again get your text field, and we do some magic which, that we instrument it. And the only thing we do is we add this little enriched um, button, which is not styled like a button yet, but just to get you the idea. So that's just the link you can click. And when you click it, again, some magic goes on. Um, this magic is called named entity recognition. Don't, don't have to think about that. And actually, it gives you some suggestions um, what things could be. So the yellow things are stuff where the system found some suggestions. Um, the red things are stuff where the system didn't find suggestions. And so you see it has some false positives, like the while was detected or the we was detected. But for example, Macy's and Coles was also detected, which are company names in this case. And you can now again click this annotation, so you click Coles, 
And what you get is the same annotation widget you already know, where you can again choose uh, which is the company you meant. So for example, there is the Kohl's, or I don't know what other Kohl's are there in terms of company names. Mm -hmm. And as soon as that happens, um, when you choose chose something, then the, the label gets green. So we have so you see, okay, it's really something which I stored there. And Again, this is, this is information which is available throughout the whole stack. So it's exported to the triple store, for example. This means that, um, that um, you can ask a question like, give me all blog posts where Barack Obama is mentioned somewhere, or give me blog posts where Coles is mentioned, or Macy's, for example, or just give me all the blog posts where both Coles and Macy's are mentioned. So that's really simple Spark QL queries, for example. Um, and I think that's a really powerful concept, and um, I'm curious what we can build with that. So, yeah, as I already said that, we can ask questions like this now. Um, it has some more bits to it, but I'll skip them for now, because it's already, I think, a pretty complex th stuff, so there's some more learning which can also happen, so the system can adapt to your needs. But that's just a topic I will not explain here because that goes too far. Um, however, um, I want to give you a short glimpse into the architecture, just a big overview. Um, and then I think we're already done. So um, we have two big parts. One is uh, um, the, the main part is the Flow3 package, which you can install. It's, it sits on top of the Flow3 persistence layer and is this domain model to RDF mapping. So that's the central component. This is what you configured with your annotations or with your YAML configuration. And on top of that are, are three components. And these three components correspond to the three layers, which we already, which we already introduced in the beginning. The first one is uh, the RDF generator, which uh, sends its data to a triple store. Um, the second one is the RDFA output, and the third one is the linkification editor. And um, that's the last part you saw. And actually, this one uses an external web service I also developed um, in Grails, uh, so it's a Java-based web service. And this then calls lots of other web services like OpenCalais, Syndis, Alchemy API, or DBpedia. So that's actually the um, so, so the heart of it is the Flow3 semantic framework, and the other one is the semantic modifier. So you might ask yourself, what is the big vision behind that? Why do we do all, do all that? Um, I think there's something which is quite underrepresented. Um, as I already said, when, when we think about semantic web, we, we think about publicly available data. So we think about... Um, Data which um, like DBpedia, like encyclopedias, I don't know what the word is, um, or how to spell it. Um, but there's some other big use case to that, I think, which is you can also use it inside a company um, to unify all the different data you have in your system. So, for example, many companies, I guess, have a shared calendar, they have an email system, they have some project management, time tracking, invoicing, so there are a lot of different components. And as a company, you have like two ways right now. One way is you use one big system, like SAP, um, which you can do, of course, but nobody likes to use. Or on the other hand, you can use many different systems, and then you have the problem, how do I integrate this data? And what you usually do right now is you use all the proprietary APIs, all the systems built, and then you do some custom code and all that. So it's quite involved to integrate all that. However, what we could do is we could put all the data we have in our systems in this triple store, in this one central big triple store. And then um, from this triple store, we can extract data again which is unified across all the data sources. So, for example, we could build um, a dashboard which shows both your emails and your open tasks from the issue tracking. This is just a Spark QL query running against a triple store and then showing the results in some nice view, for example. Um, and this is actually also an architecture I could imagine really well for the TER. Um, so you could imagine um, that we have different input sources. One is, for example, the, the web service where you can upload your extensions or your Flow3 packages. The other input source is information about, flow, about typos3.org users. The third um, input could be metrics.typos3.org, and there can be all kinds of different, or yeah, the fourth one could be Forge. So you see we have lots of different services already. And um, 
by using one central store, we could um, easily um, enrich this information and find hidden information on that, and also increase the user experience quite a lot. So actually, what I'm also thinking is that the, this linked data is a really good and pragmatic approach to this uh, business intelligence, where you try to um, model your processes and try to find meta information um, about your processes. Just a quick guide what you need to do um, to get all that. Um, the first step is you have to install this semantic package. Then you annotate your domain models using these little annotations in the source code or in the configuration, mapping them to ontologies. And that's a step which I, well, I just skimmed over it quickly. Then you already have RDFA and RDF, uh, RDF and RDFA support, so the first two steps are al almost done. Um, then you install a triple store, for example, four store, um, and then you can out of the box uh, enjoy Spark UL queries on your data. Um, and triple stores are usually, they can handle a lot of data, so they can handle like billions of triples in one instance, for example, so they are really built for scaling. And then you could install the Cementifier web application and activate it, and then you could also enjoy this um, interlinked data for strings and longer texts, which is, I think, really cool. <laughs> um, yeah, as said, the first two parts are, I think, quite stable. The last one is still a lot more experimental. Um, some resources still. Um, so my diploma thesis will be available as of mid-November. It's also written in English, and it contains some more, um, more um, explanations about linked data and also more about the concepts, what you need to know. So this a part of this diploma thesis will be also published as the manual for linked data publishing. Um, and both of these packages are developed on GitHub, so the, the semantic package and the semantifier under these URLs. Um, yeah, my Twitter account is sqfirst, where I will announce certainly that when I'm finished and lots of other things. Um, yeah, so I think that's it. Um, any questions? Any comments? Thanks. Yeah. Thanks. I think it's great, uh, especially when you check it locally, as you said. But um, I have a question. Um, it's not that uh, the, all the information is put in the triple store. So it's a manual thing. You have to put it inside. So if, for example, the author forgets to link Macy's, you will not find this blog article when you're searching for where Coles and Macy's is, is, um, is mentioned. It's true. Yeah, that's correct. Um, you always, I mean, um, Actually, the first two things you get without any manual work. So you can export all your domain models, um, so information about your products, your product prices, your type of three extensions, whatever is stored in a Flow 3 domain model, you can export with very little work and with no user work at all. Um, for all these magic, which looks at strings and, and does some rough matching, you know, um, the thing is that this is, um, you cannot, well, it's not, the fully guaranteed that you always find everything, but that's also not the point, because you could also decide to only match the thing or to only tag the things which are really important for a certain article. So I totally agree with you that this is a different topic than, for example, having a full text index about everything. So that's what your question might hint to. But um, it could be a good addition to it, certainly. Uh, so, uh, if I got it right, uh, then all the nouns in the text should be linkable to some parts of the semantic data. Uh, wouldn't it be better then to help choose some categories for the data for the user to suggest? Actually, that's what's done in the first step. So, the, what, as, what you saw uh, with this linkification process, this is actually a two-step process or a three-step process. In the first step, the language is detected of the text. In the second step, it finds these nouns and finds the categories for these nouns. So, it actually finds, oh, Macy's is a company name. And that's an automated process, which is already well used in research. And, this, and, and the third, but it also has some false positives, as you saw the we, for example. And the third part is the finding of the URLs in the semantic web. Um, but we really try to, I mean, to make it as easy as possible for the user. That's why we only show the full matches. 
First of all, thank you very much. It's a very inspiring presentation. Um, I'd like to hear what are your views on uh, on RDFA versus uh, microdata and microformats, yeah. and uh, would it be um, if you, uh, depending on what you what your answer to that question is, would this at some point support uh, schema.org and microformats like that? Yeah. So yeah, microformats are certainly a pragmatic approach to tagging information. Um, however, what they don't provide is this link to the semantic web. So the only thing they provide is telling, okay, this is an address, this is something, so you know, only the little parts, but they don't provide the big picture, um, the, they don't provide the URL where you can find more information. Um, however, it is possible to convert these microformats to RDF or to RDF triples using a, a system called GRDDL or some funny abbreviation, but actually there's, it's a, uh, um, W3C standard, which um, takes care of that. And so you can actually, um, for example, the, all the semantic web search engines, they also search if you tag it f with this micro format. So it's certainly a pragmatic approach to that, I would say. Your, your triple store, is in, in which kind of architecture do I have to think of? It's a, is it a, a database or is it a Cassandra store or what, okay. what, what kind of things do I have? Yeah, um, I mean from the user's perspective it's something like a database, so you put your data in there, but not in terms of tables and rows and so on, but um, but actually, and um, but internally it's a completely different architecture, so it's not comparable, it's, it's like, well, you, on the one side you have the classical table-oriented relational databases. On the next step, you have the document-based data stores, where also Cassandra fits in. And then on the third step, is actually, you, you, you tear the document apart and you store the single entities. So actually, it's like the third step. Um, it's like going from relational databases to document-based. Yeah, it's a graph database, certainly, yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, do we have some uh, cleanup mechanisms built in? So um, when I, for example, have a text and I put some links in and they got transferred to the triple store mm -hmm. and I delete this text, uh, will they, uh, the triple Yeah, side that's, that's what always happens in the background. All the time you modify the, the, for example, when you have a blog post and you just change something, then that's directly reflected in the triple store. So the, the data is directly updated in the triple store. There is some more behind that. So if, you're, if you know something about triple stores, I can explain that, how it works in detail after this, I would say. But um, it's always up to date in the triple store. Okay, so then thank you. And um, if you want to contact me, then just I'm still around.